to answer your very complicated and difficult question, let me divide the survivors from the Holocaust into three groups. One group who completely lost their faith. After witnessing all these atrocities, barbarism, inhumanity, seeing their own children sent to the gas chambers, seeing their parents killed, seeing, seeing their siblings, brothers, sisters, some of their wives being killed. So they thought to themselves, the Jewish concept of God, Hashem is omniscient, he knows everything. Hashem is omnipotent, he's almighty. Hashem is also avorachamim, compassionate or merciful. How can such an omniscient, almighty God, who knows everything, how did he permit such atrocities, such inhumanity? Especially we are the Manifchar, we are also the Amsegula, the beloved people, the cherished people, the chosen people. Where was God when we needed him? In such a times, six million innocent Jews, they saw their own children thrown into the gas chambers. How could you reconcile the idea of God who is omniscient, he knows everything, he's almighty, he's all merciful with permitting such atrocities? So they came to the logical conclusion, you have to say there's no God. Because if there would be God, how can he allow, why didn't intervene? At the best, if God does exist, it's a God who is indifferent to human suffering. He resides somewhere in the seventh heaven. He doesn't care what goes on in this physical world. So who is such a God? So some people came to this conclusion. We have to say either God doesn't exist altogether, or if yes, it's a God who doesn't care for human suffering. So stop believing. <clears throat> There's another group of Jews whom I would call the status quo Jews, who before they came to Auschwitz, they be believed in God, observant Jews. In Auschwitz, they still believed and still were observed to the extent what a person could, uh, could observe. And after they came back, for the camps, still believe. When someone asks such a person, how could you believe when you yourself saw this tremendous savagery, this tremendous suffering, how can you say, I still believe in God? So their answer is, who are we to understand God? Don't we say in prayer, in the high, in, you know, the high holidays, Hashem Kippur, and, and actually also every night in Kishwa Shalamito, they pray before we retire at night, Ato Yodea Rose Oilam. Only God knows the mysteries, the secrets of the world. So how can we understand Hashem's ways, God's ways? Can a, a little ant understand human mind? We are our distance between us and God is a, 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 further, a bigger chasm than between an ant and a human mind, intellect. So that's what the answer and says, just like the famous Mishnaic sage, Nachum Gamzu. What was his famous slogan? Gamzu let tell you everything was good, although we don't understand it. What did Rabbi Kiva say? Kol ma'ashovit rachman, what Hashem does, let tell you it's only for the good. We don't understand it, eventually we are going to understand. So they did dismiss this question, because human mind cannot fathom the almighty infinite God. There's a third, in other words, they remain the status quo of what they were before, in the camp they believed, before the camp believed, and afterwards they still believe. Then there's a third group that not only they do not deny the existence of God like the first group, and they're not in the status quo uh, group who just maintain their amuna, uh, their faith, but actually what they witnessed in the Holocaust that even strengthened and invigorated their amuna. They came coming, uh, coming out from, from the, of all these death camps and witnessing things, the miraculous things which happened to them. They say they are more convinced than ever there must be a God. Let me tell you a little, little story. There's a famous Rebbe Yitzchak Bar 
He was a well-known scholar and genius even before he got married. He's even a young man. He got married, and after a year of, of marriage, he said to his wife, he sh she should excuse him. He wants to learn, go to the Shiva of the Medici Magid, the Magid of Mezrich, who was the successor of the Baal Shem Tev. His wife gave him permission, and after a year, he came back. His father-in-law was very furious. After a year of marriage, you leave my wife, my, my daughter, and you leave her, you go to the Shiva. What did you learn, but you didn't know before? You were a world renowned scholar even before. What did you learn? She answered, I learned there's a God in the world. There's a God. The, the, his father-in-law became very upset. This is what you learned. That's why you have to leave, uh, abandon, uh, leave my, my daughter for a whole year. This is my maid knows there's a God. And he calls, calls his, his mate and he says by the name, Rachel, is there a God? She said, oh, for sure there's a God. So he said, what did you learn? So but she said, she says, and I know. In other words, she says, but she believes, but I'm convinced that there's a God. So let me say in all my humility, with all my humility, I belong to the third group, that I'm more convinced than ever before, although we were religious Jews before we came to, uh, 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 to Auschwitz. But what I went through has even strengthened my amuna. I'm more convinced than ever before. What we learned, there must be a God in the world. Let me start again with a little story. Um, here in New York, Lower East Side, there's a famous street called Roch uh, Orchard Street. Orchard Tr Street, the vendors keep their merchandise outside on the street, and you can get the best merchandise for bargain prices, very cheap, very good prices. You can get the best shirts, best shoes, best trousers, best suits, hats, very cheap. Many years ago, I went on Orchester uh, with my wife, and we didn't go to, to shop, we just had to go through Orchester Street. And so a vendor stops me, says, young man, have a beautiful, beautiful shirt. They're bargain prices, very cheap prices. Why do you come in? Why do you step in, in our store? You'll be able to pick up beautiful sh uh, shirts for very cheap prices. So I tell him, indeed, I like very much nice shirts, especially if I get very cheap. But now is not the time I should look for shirts even at cheap prices. He says, why not? He says, because it's Friday afternoon. This is Manhattan. I live in Brooklyn in Crown Heights. To still catch two, uh, two buses. It's late in the afternoon. So I'm hurrying to get be be home before Shabbos. So this person hears that because of Shabbos, I'll forego such beautiful shirts. And for such a good prices, he says, for Shabbos you forego these beautiful shirts? What Shabbos? Why Shabbos? For Shabbos you forego. So I said, what do you mean? For me, Shabbos is something very important. And I start to explain to him. He says, young man, Shabbos doesn't mean anything. The whole Torah doesn't mean anything. And God doesn't mean anything. So here I was challenged. I says, what do you mean? Shabbos doesn't mean anything. Torah doesn't mean anything. Hashem, God doesn't mean anything. He says to me, young man, if you would see what I saw, what you would, if you would experience what I experienced, he would speak in the same way. And he says, so I asked him, tell me, what did you see what I didn't see? What did you experience what I didn't experience? So he put his hand on that bit of his chest. He says, I was in Auschwitz. And after Auschwitz, you can't believe in God. So certainly not in Torah, I said not in Shabbat. After above what I saw in Auschwitz, impossible to believe in God. So I tell him, Tell me, dear man, how old were you when you were in Auschwitz? He says to me, I don't remember, I 22, 23. He said, well, I was 10 years old when I was in Auschwitz. He looked at me like I'm exaggerating. You know, no children came out from Auschwitz. So what did I do? I pulled back my sleeve, opened up my shirt, and I showed him my tattoo. 
this person, this vendor, was shocked. He was speechless. He saw here a little child, a young boy, 10 years old, which everybody perished in Auschwitz. And here he went through, and I tell him, I wasn't only in Auschwitz. I was in seven different death camps, extermination camps. And I still believe this person became as white as my shirt. He went back to his office, the store. He slumped down in his easy chair and his head down. He was lost in his thoughts. I here, although I, I was in a hurry, but I wanted to continue the conversation about the importance of Shabbat, I still can believe. But I, I, this person completely was immersed in his thoughts, lost in his thoughts, looking down like this. And he didn't speak. So my wife said, it's getting late to get back to Crown Heights. So let's go home. So I said, good. We come back next time. We come to Orchard Street. We come on Orchard Street. I'll continue my conversation. And then I'll buy by him a, a, a shirt. It ca we came back maybe six or eight weeks later. Again, we had to pass through Orchard Street. We came to the store. There was no more this vendor. A different store owner owned this store. I asked the new store owner, what happened to the old store owner? He says, he doesn't know exactly sold the store, and he doesn't know what happened to him. So my part is only educated guess that he saw, he thought that after Auschwitz, after all these death camps, a person cannot consciously, intellectually, logically believe in God. Here he sees a, a little child who went through six, six or seven death camps and still maintains his belief in God. And for him, Shabbos is important, changed his life. He sold this store because on Orchard Street, you cannot be a successful vendor if you keep the, the because of competition, if you keep the stores open. So he said he's going to sell this store. And wherever he's going to go, open a store, another store, wherever he's going to go, he'll be able to keep Shabbos. So here we see that diametrically two poles. Before he, they said, it's impossible to believe. And here he sees a little child, but he was only 10 years old, and he still believes very firmly. Now you can ask the question, what made me, I said, I belong to the third group, that not only that I didn't lose my faith, and I not only I remained status quo, at the same level, but truly after the Holocaust experiences, my belief in God is so much more stronger, more logical, more convincing to myself. What is it? What made it? So let me tell you. If you have a dice, you throw down the dice and you, it comes out number six. See, it's a luck. Number six is the best number. When you play a game, you get the dice, number six is the best, best number. How about after you throw the dice a second time, you get again number six, what will you say? It's lucky. How about you throw it a third time and you still get number six? So you are very lucky. But how about this reoccurs? Time and again, every time you throw the dice and every time it's number six, means something must be going on. Naturally, such thing is impossible. Because something recurs again and again and again, something is going on. So let me just tell you. I saw Nisim and Mofsi miracles. If I'm here today, Baruch Hashem, and I can speak to you, I can ask you questions. What I went through, seven death camps, I was on the, on the verge of death, on the threshold of death, of death, time and again. And nevertheless, I survived. It's only by nissim, nissim, miracles upon, upon miracles. So let me just tell you, Avram Avinu, you are thrown by Nimrod into the fiery furnace. He came out alive. Is it a physical phenomenon? Is it natural? Everybody will tell you, it's a less, a miracle. How can a person find a burning furnace? In fire, it comes out alive.
How about Daniel, Daniel? He was thrown in the lion's den, who were not fed for a whole week. He was thrown in the lion's den. Should the lions devour him? He came out alive. Is it a miracle? Obviously, because it's not a natural thing. I, in a lion's den, not being fed for several days, you're thrown in a, a living person, they should immediately kill him, devour him. So everybody will say this is not a natural phenomenon, it's a miracle. I was also in the, fine, in the burning furnace. I was also in lion's den. Let me tell you, I was twice the clutches of Mengele. I will not, Mengele, who with this thumb, the flick, the, uh, how they just moved his thumb, flicked his thumb to the left, gas chamber, right? Over a million children sent to the gas chamber. He came to me and asked, what am I, what's my age? I told him, I'm 17. He started to laugh and says, I know that you're, not, uh, you're only 11. I wasn't 11. I was only, uh, only 10. But it's good with your father. I was another time, also in the, in the clutches of Mengele, he should send me to the gas chamber. Yet ask, over a million and a half, but Mengele didn't send a million and a half children, only one million. But how many, mil, how many hundreds of thousands of Jews, the flicker of a, of a, of a finger, he sent to the gas chamber. It was twice in his clutches. And Baruch, uh, Baruch Hashem, both times, he his, 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 his didn't send me to the gas chamber, and I was saved. Let me just jump ahead to the death march. When the Jews were evacuated from Auschwitz to Germany, because the Russians came, didn't want to leave any, any witnesses um, um, uh, in Auschwitz. So the oldest hundreds of thousands of Jews were evacuated to Germany. Why is it called the death march? Because people died there like flies from both sides. Of the, 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 we were marching piles of Jewish corpses, Jewish dead bodies. I had a heavy leather boot and I didn't have any socks. We marching, it was January, February, March. This heavy winter snow, freezing, freezing. And this heavy leather boot bore into my leg, to my foot, and it kept on scraping away the skin, the skin, until the flesh, the muscles, until it scraped away, it bore away until the bone. And every time as we were, were marching, uh, the boot went into the snow, I had to push the boot, and it scratched my bone. I saw every star in the sky from the pain. Eventually, I simply, the pain from the ankle went up all the way to the thigh. I just could not move anymore. This, this foot was completely out of commission. I couldn't move. So I thought to myself, I won't be able to march many m m more miles. Let me just move out a few, a few inches from the line. But you must know that the yak is so punctual, if anybody moved out a few inches from the line, you ought to be shot. That's why you have the piles on both sides. So I thought to myself, well, let me just move out uh, from the pile, from the line, and I'll be one of those piles, one body. As I made this firm decision, it's impossible, the pain is so tremendous that I can't move, uh, move anymore. I made this decision to move out. Suddenly, a thought came to my mind. I remembered a Friday night Suda at home, Czechoslovakia, Friday night. It was the custom of my father always to tell stories of Tzadikim. Hashem to the Badichever, we were not the Badichever, Sidim, but all these Rebbe, Reb Zusher, Melch, all the stories. So I remembered one story which my father said Friday night. The Chosid came to the Baal Shem Tev. And usually when a Chosid comes to a Rebbe, he stayed there for a few days. He was there, and suddenly in the middle of the night, a messenger comes for him, to him, a message from his wife, that unexpectedly she's going to labor, 
of course, he, she would have, he would have known, he would have left his wife. But he thought maybe it's, it'll be another few weeks. And, but she goes suddenly into labor. In those days, there were no doctors or nurses or hospitals. Everything was done at home with a midwife. But midwife needed someone should help. She couldn't do everything herself. So he should immediately come home because she's going to labor and she'd come help the midwife. And this was middle of the night. Between Mezibus, where Basemtov was living, and this town was a dense forest. This forest was at night infested with robbers, gangsters, thieves, rapists. So at, during, at night, people were afraid to go through this forest. During the daytime, many people went, so it wasn't so dangerous. But at night, people uh, were afraid to go. Now his wife asked me should come immediately. So he goes to the Baal Shem, the middle of the night. He says, my wife asked me she should come immediately if she, she's going to labor. But I'm afraid to go alone. So Baal Shem Tev said, since your wife needs you, go immediately. Insofar as you say that you are afraid to go alone, a Jew never goes alone. You understand what Baal Shem Tev meant? A Jew never goes alone, it's always Hashem goes with him. It was the moral of the story, that's what my father said Friday night to the children and also the guests. That I should always know, don't be afraid of anything, a Jew never goes alone. And suddenly this story, this moral, this teaching came to me, suddenly I, I remembered it. This gave me such a strength that I'm not alone and I decided not to, this, that to move out and I continue to push because Hashem will help me. So how long could I push? Maybe another half the day, another, uh, another uh, day. But eventually, the pain not only came to my thigh, from the thigh over to my shoulders, my left side completely out of commission. I just simply, my left side, I couldn't move anymore. So how can you walk? So again, after a, a day, a day and a half, after this story, I came to the conclusion, it's impossible I should survive. The half of this is completely, I, I can't move with my leg. And it's in pain and I can't um, march. So as I made again the second time this decision to move out, and this will be the end of my suffering, believe me, suddenly a person came to me and started with me a conversation. In this death march, there was no conversation. Everybody just in himself to see how long can we survive. Don't forget, we didn't get anything what to eat. What did we eat? Only the muddy snow. When the SS were tired of it and we rested for, for a few hours, we scraped away the snow and the ice and we started to dig into the ground. And luckily we found an earthworm. This was it. Otherwise, we just eat this muddy snow. So completely emaciated, without any strength, in this pain. Yes. So everybody just thinking about themselves, how can you survive? And suddenly, nobody, just like for example, you God forbid you're on a boat and the boat sinks, capsizes. Everybody jumps out and starts to swim to the shore. We'll start a conversation. Tell me who are you? What's your name? Where you come from? Everybody's thinking just how to save themselves. This was the situation in the death march. So, and suddenly this person comes over to me. I was also surprised, but nobody spoke. Everybody's thinking about himself, how can you survive? And we started a little conversation. And eventually I find out he comes from the same city, just like where I come from. But he was one of those twins, which I didn't mention, the twins and Mengele didn't kill him in, uh, in Auschwitz. But actually, he was actually much older than me. He was already also 80, 90 years old. So I tell him, listen, this is my condition. Half of my body is out of commission, kaput. I can't. And I can't just jump, hop on one foot. So I'll just move out. You are much stronger, much older than me. You'll come back to where I come from, to Kosciuszko and Czechoslovakia. Hope films that Shabez Hashem, my parents will also come back. You'll tell them where I was shot, where I was killed. Maybe I'll be still there, and they'll take me bring me home, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be buried in a Jewish cemetery. I shouldn't rot away there on the highway. She says, no, 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 no. Listen, do, don't do that. 
I, I, you'll see that you'll survive. He says, how can I survive? I can't move. So he says to me, I'll help you. So I ask him, what can you help me? Can you drag me? Can you slap me? Can you drag me? Can you pick me up? He says, no, no. Put your hand on my shoulder, and you just go. So the uh, left foot, you don't have to carry. You don't have to walk on the left foot, on the right foot, and I'll slap you. So good, I accepted this. And for another two or three days, it was OK. But let me ask you, how long can you hop on one foot? My left foot, I couldn't move anymore. I didn't feel it anymore. And he actually helped me. But I just had to hop on my right foot and slap, drag my left foot after me. After two or three days, even my right foot, I couldn't walk anymore. So I tell him again, listen, I'm very appreciative. I'm very grateful what you did for me. That you, you prolonged my life another two, three days, but I can't continue. It's impossible. My foots are also going out of commission. I cannot do it. So I says, I'll just move out and please notice where I'll be shot. And to tell my parents the place in Germany where I was shot. As I even, he couldn't dissuade me anymore. I shouldn't, I shouldn't give up. He saw that I just wouldn't walk anymore. Listen, in this moment, SS comes over to me, an SS, and starts with that conversation. And I knew for my mother tongue was German. I spoke a perfect German. So he had this conversation with me, and after a few minutes, I tell him, but listen, I just can't move anymore. Let me move out, and you shoot me. He says, no, no, no. I promise you, you'll survive the war, and you meet your parents, and your sister, the only one sister. He said, but how can I can move? And I was so hungry. So he takes off from his belt, takes off the canteen, and he gives me the canteen. And the canteen was hot, black, sweet, black coffee. As I drank, I gulped down this black coffee was truly, truly, just like our sages tell us, when Matthias Amazing, the revival of the dead, how Hashem revived the dead, that it's called Tal Tchia, the Jew of revival. I experienced it, this Jew of revival. When he gave me this black coffee, it went to every vein, every artery, every muscle, every arm, every part of my body. It just invigorated me, re-energized me, and I could walk. And I finished the, the canteen, the bottle of uh, the black coffee, and then he disappeared. I never wondered where did he go, because we had to go very fast. And maybe I had to watch other, uh, other uh, this, uh, inmates. But every few hours, every two, three hours, the German reappeared and continued the conversation. And every time he took off the canteen, after a few minutes uh, speaking, and he gave me the canteen. And this truly tal here. This invigorated me, re-energized me, gave me anything. Once I was on a, on a very, between Poland and Germany, a very high mountain. And March this is in February. It's very cold, freezing cold. We march up to a very high mountain and then down. There's miles, miles. My ears were freezing. So I tell him everything's good and well. But I have the coffee. I gave him a little bit, gain, I gained a little strength, but my ears are freezing. He takes off his ear cap, the SS cap, I mean, the SS cap, puts that on my head, pulls that down over my ears. I was walking, marching with his SS cap, and he was uh, marching uh, bareheaded. Without any doubt, if any SS would see that I have an uh, SS cap, they would immediately shoot me. But anyways, and then again, he gave me the coffee, and by this time, he knew already where my father, but the, the business of my father, where did he study, and the whole family, my grandparents, because they always have the conversation. Once he comes to me, and he starts also the conversation, and usually after five, ten minutes, he would give me the coffee. First, we were just engaged in a conversation, and afterwards, he would give me the coffee. This time, after five, ten minutes, nothing. So I tell him, by this time I thought I'm entitled to, no, where is the coffee? No, where is the coffee? 
So he opens up, takes off the, ca the, the canteen, opens up the canteen, takes it upside down, says, I even I don't have any more coffee. So I tell him, if that's the case, let me out from the, from the line and shoot me because I can't continue. She so said, no, 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 don't do it. I promised you before, and let me reiterate it again. I promise you, you'll survive the war and you'll meet your parents. But they have no strength. I can't walk anymore. So remember, I was walking with my arms on the shoulder of my friend. I said, I can't m march anymore. He says, in for six kilometers from now, we come to a German town. I go to the first house on the way, and I get you coffee. But I said, I can't, walk, I can't march the six, mi six miles. So he says to me, I'll help you. So I was marching, holding the hand of my friend, and his asses were holding his hand under my arm and schlepping me for the next kilometers. This SS. And indeed, we came, after six kilometers, we came to the first German town. He went to the, Ger uh, to, uh, to the house. We, of course, we had to give fast ahead. He ran, he ran after us, and he gave me the coffee. This time, it wasn't any more sh uh, sweet, but it was hot, but black coffee. I drank it, and he says to me, now please give me back my cap. I gave him back his cap. He disappeared. I never saw this SS again. When I came back from Auschwitz, I, uh, Auschwitz, when I mentioned Auschwitz, I mean old, it's a generic term for all the camps. So I myself was in six, seven death camps. But this is the generic term for all the camps. When I came back from the Holocaust, from, the, from Auschwitz. So I started to write my experiences. But I came to this episode, and I mentioned, uh, described, but in much greater detail, the death march. What was going on in the death march? This is only what I told you, the tip of the, of the iceberg. So I came to, the, to this SS. When he asked me, I should give him back his cap. And then I mentioned, who was this SS? Knowing that Hitler sent the Germans to the camp, the scum of the earth, the biggest murderers, rapists, gangsters, who was afraid to keep them in G Germany, said that they should be all our overlords. They didn't have any m feeling, any compassion for any Jew, for every Jewish child, the murder, a, year, a, year, a million and a half. Suddenly, this SS should have mercy, compassion, a little, little wretched child. That maybe, perhaps, perhaps, this is Elianovi in disguise as a German. Then I, I mentioned from the Gomorrah, which Gomorrah mentions a number of places where they wish to send Elianovi in, in the disguise of a human being, an Arab, and so on and so forth, to help a Jewish child. So I said, maybe, maybe, perhaps, this was also Elianovi came to help me. And he slept me, and he gave me the coffee. And I felt so invigorated when he gave me the coffee. But then I concluded, even suppose it wasn't Elianovi, it was actually a, a German, SS. But knowing who they were, these worst criminals, who the most callous, vicious people for them to, can, to uh, kill a Jew meant nothing, this SS should suddenly have a little Rachmanes compassion, a Jewish child, is not less of a, of, of a miracle than it was Elianovi. And let me tell you, this is truly just the tip of the iceberg of the nissanism of the threshold so many times of death. And in the nick of time, something happened. How can I not believe? So that's why, not only that I believe, theoretically, I saw, I saw the hand of God who saved me. And let me make this suggestion. Not one survivor who came out from Auschwitz survived in a natural manner. Only miraculously. But as our sages tell us, in Balanes, Maki Benis, not everybody recognized and many times a miracle can happen to a person. And himself does rec recognize this is a miracle. So many people, all of those who lost their faith, if they were themselves would, they, would you ask them, how did you survive? Tell me what happened to you. They should tell you that their life stories. How, how did this happen? How did this happen? You have to come to conclusion is something supernatural. 
they themselves will also see the, the help, the hand of God. How come if Hashem helped me, and say so all of those millions of Jews who did survive, how come Hashem didn't help my father? For this only Hashem knows the answer. But those who did survive is only a penicillin. As the Chazal tells, if a person has a dream, and has in his dream a Hebrew word, in which his Hebrew word has a letter nun in it, the Chana, Nachman. So then you should know a miracle will happen to him. How about a person has a dream, in which the word is not only one nun, and this will happen. You have the two nuns, so Nisim, Nisim, miracles of a miracle will happen. For me, not only the, 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 word, the very word of my name is Nisim, miracles. So day in and day out, as I tell you, I, just, I, I mentioned a fraction of the things which I went through, which every logical person, objective person will say, how did this happen? It's only about Nisim, Nisim, and my name is Nisim. So therefore, I'm more convinced than ever that Master Bakhtishwar was holding my hand, just like Baal Shemtev says, a Jew never goes alone.